here on the podcast with James Harenshar. And James is the president and CEO of Response Marketing Group. They are a consumer data focused marketing agency in Richmond, Virginia. And Jim is responsible for relationship development and account strategy at this independent agency. They offer marketing strategy and planning, data analytics, and interactive services. They help out in financial services, in tourism, and in healthcare. So we're going to go into some of these deep questions. We're going to talk about how marketing has changed, but also what hasn't changed and what's happening for us towards the future. And Jim's or James's website, so we can plug it early, is rmg-usa.com. So Jim, glad to be speaking with you here. Thank you, Robert. I am happy to be here. Wonderful. And we're, we're both a couple of happy guys. And so we did our best to introduce you, hype you up for the audience. But in your own words, what are you all about? What has you currently focused and passionate? Yeah, so we are 38 years old in October. We celebrated our 38th anniversary. So a company that has been around for quite some time, we have seen a tremendous change in the marketing landscape. So when our firm started years ago, 1986 to be exact, there were really only two what we called below the line channels. So you had your radio, TV, billboards, all of that above the line advertising. But for below the line, you had telemarketing phone calls, which occurred when everybody was eating dinner, or you had direct mail. And so that is the environment that the firm started. And our whole value proposition was how to be able to increase response of direct mail. So back in the late 80s, early 90s, we did a lot of work in financial services. We were really the masters of targeting, building predictive models and targeting households that were likely to respond based on the product or service that the client was selling. Fast forward to today and, and specific answer to your question, uh, you know, the world has changed. Marketing world has certainly changed the landscape, the number of channels. We're, we're far removed from direct mail and telemarketing as being the bread and butter of below the line advertising. So what we really focus on is helping clients understand how to evaluate the success of their marketing campaigns, specifically focused on response attribution. How do we measure return on investment from all those different channels that we now have to choose from and determine which is the one that is generating the most positive ROI and focusing on ways to test other channels to determine which may be emerging markets for them. Very nice. So it seems like there's there's two maps, right? There's the, the map as far as like the, the people and like, who am I going to target? But there's also this other map of which marketing channels. And I love how you, you kind of mentioned that, well, there's these kind of old school methods, but then they're, they're still in use today, right? And if anything, it's always fun to say, well, is there something like direct mail or cold calling? And if it's not as sexy as it was in 1986, then maybe it's maybe less crowded or it works well for like this age group and not another age group. And it's like um, a lot of these methods are like, you know, still in use, but like modernized, right? Like I, you're making me think that with the cold calling, uh, I sometimes assign my employees to make calls and there's like an app where I can like listen in like in real time. So it's like the same, but different. And then with the, uh, the with the direct mail and the postcards, now we've got AI so we can like super personalize the message. And so out of all of these different like techniques and toys in the toy box, it's easy to get like the analysis paralysis or just like geek out too much without taking enough action. So out of all of these things that you deliver for your clients, I know everyone's different, but is there a particular channel that is noteworthy that like excites you or maybe is is wide open these days? Well, may not be the answer you're looking for, but I will say this. I think one of the reasons we've been successful for 38 years is because we're channel agnostic, right? So because I'm not, a, I, I don't buy media on behalf of clients, I have no preference. To me, it's about what works. So our whole approach has been, let's look at the landscape that is available to you, recognizing there are six, eight, a dozen different channels that you may choose to include, even things like influencer marketing, which for your product, for your service, for your value proposition as a client of ours may be compelling. But we don't know that until we're able to actually ascribe some level of response attribution, right? GA4 is, is a wonderful tool. Google Analytics in general is a wonderful tool adopted in 2005, but it's now 19, almost 20 years old. 
what RMG has done is really launched some proprietary ad technology that allows us to advance that at a much deeper level and not just look at anonymized aggregate data, but the ability to get at an individual household level. And so we have the capability working with our clients to use a proprietary technology, placing a pixel in the header of a website so we can de-anonymize that website visitor. We maintain 150 million normative database of publicly available information, so all fully compliant with all of the state regulations that we have in the U.S., as well as GDPR compliant, so that we can determine that Robert was actually on the website last night. He clicked on an ad that he was exposed to on Facebook, and here's all the pages that he viewed and how long he spent time on those pages. And oh, by the way, here's another 200 demographics on Robert. So we know his age, his income, whether he has children, how old his, ch his children are, what type of car he drives, does he rent or does he own, what's the value of his house, you know, all of that information that is able to be gathered from public available sources. Amazing. So you, you figured a lot of this out. And I can imagine that if, if some company doesn't have you, or maybe before they had you, it's easy to let the, the intuition and the emotions get in the way, right? When you, you, ha you just... They're, they're so sure, like, I need to market here. I need to market to these people. And so you're saying, well, we need to look at the data. We need to combine all these different sources. That way we act based on reality, not just based on our feelings. So is that on the right track? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'll give you an example, Robert. It happens to us a lot. When we engage with a client at first, in their mind, they are doing a targeted ad buy. And they're focused on um, households, women in households with children who make over $100,000. And so all of their ad targeting, all their ad spending is focused on whatever channels are going to deliver to that specific audience segment. We will deploy our pixel. We'll go back and analyze who's actually coming only to find that in reality, it is 65-year-old men making under $60,000. So while... Google Analytics may tell you, yes, you're getting response and you're all excited that, oh yeah, it looks like our ad campaigns are working. In reality, you're driving the completely wrong audience. So understanding exactly who's coming, getting at a granular level drives a much more transparent sense of, you know, what is the response we're getting and, and is it from the right segment? I love it. And I really like your mindset here, especially because this might not be the way that the like, say, say you, you get one of these clients, they might not be thinking this way, or they might not even like really have the ability to think in, in this way, at least not comfortably, right? And that's where you can jump in and say, hey, like, we're the black box, we'll make this work for you. And so, uh, you know, you've worked in all these industries, right? Work for all these decades. Is there a fun story that you can share as far as one of these companies you helped and, and work some of this magic that you're talking about? Yeah, we, well, we do we do work as you highlighted at the outset in a variety of different uh, industries. I'll, I'll share a real quick story um, for a client that a lot of people know, and that would be Ritz Carlton. We've had a fabulous relationship with them for a long time, and we were we were brought to the table under the direction that we they wanted to improve targeting to the various audience segments. So it started with a full out segmentation, right? So we analyzed all of their past guests for three years and identified which were the segments that were the highest revenue generating segments. And to just make our story quick, there were three primary segments that were vastly different, right? So you have a leisure traveler, um, you have a business traveler. The business traveler books typically within 60 days or less. The leisure traveler that's going to say a resort destination on the beach somewhere typically books 11 months in advance. So two completely different booking windows and they look completely different, right? So the business traveler wants to stay typically in, a, in an urban destination in close to downtown, close probably to a business meeting, uh, whereas the other, the leisure traveler, depending upon the segment of leisure, um, wants to stay at a beach location, right? So again, all that, factoring all these different things. And then the other side of this is, if I had asked you um, of all of the Ritz-Carlton advertising you've ever seen, what comes to mind, your answer, likely would be a 60 plus year old white couple standing in some um, beach destination. But what we found in doing the deep dive in the data is that 72% of their past guests had a child 17 or under in the household. 
Yet you never, ever saw kids in Ritz Carlton ads. You never saw kids in, you know, on stand up paddle boards or building sandcastles at their destination. So as we worked with them to align the landing page at these different revenue generating segments, we increased their booking rates by 30 percent in about six to nine months by testing and improving the imagery that we were using, the copy that we were using um, and the booking windows that we were displaying that data. That, well, that's super cool. And so just to kind of um, like kind of dissect this a little bit, is, is it safe to say that uh, as far as like the thought process here, right? The people say some company says, hey, here's what our customers like. And you say, well, after I look at a lot of I kind of, you know, flip through them and anecdotally, like look at all these different people and like break it down. You say, well, here's kind of the, the subgroups. And then here's what success looks like for each of the subgroups. Right. Here's kind of the, the window of time it takes like to, to get through the sales cycle. And here's where we uh, target them and follow up and, and land there. Is that kind of a safe uh, way to, to explain it? Like you say, customers, subgroups, what does success look like? And then what are the, the, the gaps? What are the missing pieces? Absolutely. Yeah, I, you hit the nail on the head. And, and again, I'll give you just a, another quick example. You know, a, a lot of us push back or, or, or we get all uh, worked up over the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm constantly exposed and barraged by all kinds of different messaging and pop ups and everything else. None of us really like that. But by the same token, you know, I'm I'm now a, a recent empty nester. So, you know, if I if I am exposed to a diaper ad, right, that, that that's way off mark. Shame on the company. There's too much data that exists out there today, Robert, where companies uh, have access to be able to tailor that marketing that occurs. And so, um, you know, I'm going to open, you know, whether you're serving the email or whatever the, the channel is that you're deploying, uh, I'm going to open something at a much higher rate if it's tailored to me, it resonates with me, the headline, the copy, the imagery aligns with where I am with, in my life versus showing me little kids in diapers and promoting, a, you know, a 50% off special on diapers that are no longer relevant for me. I think that's a huge insight because th there's always these numbers thrown out, right? Where they say like, we see 50,000 ads a day. And like, I think that might even be kind of low, especially these last right. few days, few years, right? Because uh, right. that was like something that threw out five, 10 years ago. And like, imagine what it's uh, increased to now with the, just you scroll Facebook for 10 seconds, you see 10 ads, right? And never mind right. the TikTok, the YouTube. And so, uh, but then like, I heard a, a guy, a friend of mine once years ago when, when we were all worried about the emails getting filtered, right? When the all the, the spam filtering started happening and, and if some customer hit spam on you once, then you were just in trouble for like many weeks. And this guy said, well, if I mark your email as spam, it's spam to me, right? It's not relevant to me. And then as even as you were explaining that, like my subconscious is going about thinking about, well, sometimes I get emails in my inbox. And I'm like, you know, I'll read that, I'll click it. And I might not buy, but it's not spam. And so that that's huge, right? right? If you're if you're seeing diapers, but you're an empty nester, there's the mismatch. But there are those messages we get, those emails where it's like, hey, that's exactly what I needed. Or I just I feel good reading this message and I'm not quite ready to click or buy yet. But I may be still in the warm up cycle as far as that Ritz Carlton vacation. But it but I'm, they're staying on my radar and in a month or two, then I'll be ready to go. And it's good that they kept me kind of you know, warmed up a little bit. And so, you know, you mentioned a little bit here about how things have changed, right? There's all kinds of data, social media, Google Analytics, uh, but what is the same? What's tried and true ever since 1986? Well, um, I think relevance is critical, right? So to the example you just gave, um, a lot of us are spooked out by the fact that the shopping cart widget exists or the abandoned cart widget exists. And so, gosh, you know, here I was on such and such a site and I was looking at shoes and then within an hour, Zappos sent me a follow up email that says, hey, you know, your cart is still waiting for you or we've, you know, we're, we're making you an offer, discount these shoes. We're spooked out. But the, the fact remains they're doing that because they know it works, right? All of the predictive analytics um, and, and, you know, we may end up going down an AI rabbit hole in this conversation at some point, but they, they exist to improve the relevance of the messaging and the click through rates, the engagement rates and ultimately the purchase or sale rates. And so I think that relevance is still the, the criticality where it's irrelevant. You lose faith in that company because they're probably exposing you to the same pop up that every single person does as well. 
And so, you know, that's where I think Amazon and some of these other players have excelled so well is making whatever engagement strategy they deploy relevant to you based on your behavior. That's a huge insight that even if the ad creeps you out or or make, makes you feel a little uneasy, well, hey, didn't it get your attention and didn't it get you to buy? And I'll have arguments with my wife, maybe not arguments, but all the time, my wife will say like, well, I, I talked about this and I didn't type it in, I didn't search it, uh, but I saw some ad for it and I, I my phone must be listening. I'm like, well, right. did, did you talk about it with this friend and maybe this friend searched it and because you're their friend, they also tried the ads on you. And uh, so it, it's amazing some of the the, kind of the reach or the, the the queries that are done in a detailed way that get our attention. But then if it gets us to, if it, you know, gets us to pay attention versus all the other ads and we go end up clicking and buying, then it still gets the job done. And so you mentioned AI and I mean, uh, we all have mixed feelings about AI, don't we? And, um, and it does some amazing stuff, but I still think, well, it has the ways to go, doesn't it, right? Because like Amazon keeps promising that someday they'll like buy things for you. They'll just guess what you want. I'm still waiting right. for that. I open right. up Netflix and I still like, I still click. I still go through many pages. I'm like, if the AI was that dialed in, I would open up Netflix. It would say, you want to watch this? I would say, of, of course I do. And I'd watch it instantly. So like, what are your thoughts about AI? Like what can it accomplish? Like, where does it have to go still? Well, I, I, I am not a futurist, um, but I, I do find it fascinating. You know, I, I'm, I'm old enough, been in this industry a long time. When I first started, when we had data and we utilized that to make marketing more effective, we called it predictive analytics, right? And then probably somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s, we shifted to the term big data. And everybody was talking about big data and is data now the new oil uh, as a commodity? Uh, then we went to machine learning. That became the next thing. That kind of was the, the right before we, we made it AI, it was machine learning. So now we're at AI, right? Would in reality, though, Robert, regardless of what you want to call it, it's all about managing, manipulating um, and forecasting using data. That really hasn't changed. The terms have changed, but the methodology and the application hasn't necessarily changed. I think that the machine learning aspect certainly has allowed us to be able to manipulate uh, data at, at scale and do it a whole heck of a lot faster. Uh, I'm not sure that the outcomes have necessarily changed yet. And I want to say I'm speaking about marketing specifically. I'm sure in a lot of other industries where AI is deployed, it may have you know vastly superior skill sets. There is a human element here that I think marketing still uh, is very valuable. I think as a you know, as a company owner, when you look at ways to deploy AI to be able to reach folks like you or our prospects, because we do outbound marketing via email or some other channel. And yeah, being able to have a exceptionally well-written email that's better than Jim can write is, is hopefully getting more clicks and opens. Um, but for us, I, I think that it's really all still about the data. And so foundationally, where we come across on that is I think AI is great, but if you're not collecting the data in the first place, uh, you're not measuring the responsiveness of the data, you're not continuing to update your data, then I don't think it matters whether you deploy AI or any other type of technology. Um, it's doomed to fail. So I think those are the, the critical elements of it. That's very helpful that a, a, a necessary component of this are the results and it's AI. It, is it's not just a buzzword. It's well, you have to, like you said, uh, manage, manipulate, and forecast your data. And uh, and I think you're so right that there's definitely these areas where AI is quite quite not there yet. And that's in that case, that's where we kind of use it as like an assistant, right? We go alongside it. We say, hey, well, right. uh, here's this landing page. And um, and I mean, a lot of us have tried this, right? You go to say Chat GPT, you say, write me a blog post on this, write me a landing page on this, write me a headline, an ad. And you look at it and you're like, hey, you know, that's not quite, it's it's close, but it's not quite there yet. Right. Give me 10 right. more or like, well, change it to say this. And then when we like are using, it, they're working on it and we're working on it with them, then we kind of get there and we get there. Maybe it takes an hour to write that ad instead of three hours. So I think that that's uh, some helpful insights, especially where we have to manage the data and we have to look at 
uh, what the, the that led to what the results were and optimize for the, the results. So that way we're not just saying like, hey, generate a bunch of garbage for me and no one will click on these ads. And so we've kind of jumped around all these cool topics, right? Talked about case studies, talked about marketing fundamentals, talked about ideas. But this is your time, Mr. Jim, right? You're the man of the hour. And I want to make sure that we we cover what excites you, what interests you. So in our conversation here, is there perhaps a, a missing, hidden, invisible question? Is there something that you wish I would ask you, but I just don't know to ask it? Uh, I, I would say not necessarily. I, I think that I'll, my, I guess, plea to your listeners that depending upon their level of marketing sophistication, you know, we recognize that every company, whether you are GE, GM, or the Jim Herenshaw company, we all have finite marketing budgets. Um, GEs and GMs are much larger than Jim Herenshaw's budget, but they're still finite, right? It's not an unlimited amount of money that they can then put towards marketing. And so while we have more tools than ever to be able to use, I, I implore people to start from the perspective of making sure that you can develop some sort of response attribution rather than just be sprinkling a little here, sprinkling a little there, try this, you know, oh, the, the influencer channel seems really cool. Should we consider signing somebody or do we find, you know, web-based personalities? I, that's not for me to say, but the numbers will ultimately answer that question for you. And so I think that the, the, the more focused you can be uh, on fundamentally understanding kind of what your budget is, what channels are working. Um, there's always a crawl, walk, run approach that works for almost every one of our clients, meaning that I'm not saying that you shouldn't dabble in a, in a channel, but recognize that, hey, I know 75% of my audience that is going to buy from me or engage with me or do whatever the call to action is, is going to come from channel XYZ. But I do want to test a couple others. Great thing about digital marketing, Robert, is that we can determine in two weeks whether something's working or not. We can probably, you know, determine email responsiveness in 48 hours. Um, so we, we live in a world where, unlike direct mail of 38 years ago, you kind of sent it and you crossed your fingers and you hoped that somebody either walked in the door of the company or picked up the phone to call the company. Those days are long gone. So we get response so much faster now. But the critical element is. Um, you really need to have a plan. You need to utilize that plan to be able to ascribe some level of response attribution and ROI. And from there, then you can do your testing, knowing full well that you have a strategy in place that's going to generate a dominant percentage of response. This is a very important message for us to hear. We might have uh, heard it in different ways before, but it's an excellent reminder to test and track and to, as you said, crawl, walk, run. Because I'm sure that I'm sure you've had some of the same conversations I've had, Jim, where someone said, hey, you know, I tried Facebook ad once. It didn't work out. And someone like you would say, well, what is, does that mean? You tried it. Did you run the ads? Did you just dabble? Was it just uh, kind of a quick effort? Did you actually uh, measure and track your results? And what did you do? And it's just, it's just so unfortunate that sometimes people, they, they, they try something once and they don't really uh, have an actual plan, as you're saying, and they don't look at what the response is. And so the it's the response was, I didn't make a million dollars. I didn't make one sale. I'm not really sure why. It could have been all these different bottlenecks, right? It could have been my message, my target, my landing page, my budget. Yep. It could have been all these different things. But because I didn't actually look at the numbers, I don't know. I just guessed. And so I self-sabotaged, didn't even realize it. And so moving and that, but that's okay, right? It's okay to make mistakes in the sure. past as long as we sure. learn from them. Moving forward, do better. And perhaps there's some company out there who can do better with the help of RMG to apply a, a real strategy and not just crossing our fingers. So how can someone do that? How does someone know if they're a good fit for a response marketing group? And if they are, where do they go? Well, we have a lot of information on our website. And actually, for your subscribers and listeners, um, we have a promo that we're going to run. Um, so if folks go to www.rmg, Robert Mary George, dash USA.com with the backslash marketer of the day, they will see an offer to test or try RMG services. So going to our website, we have a robust blog that covers a lot of industries, it covers a lot of topics. 
We do a lot of posting on LinkedIn. So all of the social channels that are available to everyone, you will find Response Marketing Group. We encourage you to engage with us. Very cool. And that is on brand of you, right? To, to track properly. So rmg-usa.com slash marketer of the day, because especially with a podcast, someone just throws it a URL and then someone's listening to it. You don't necessarily click the link. It's kind of like when you get like a postcard or a QR code, like who knows if someone's actually typing all the stuff or if they're actually going to the where we want them to go. So that way we know that's where they came from. So to make sure you're properly tracked, rmg-usa.com slash marketer of the day. That way you can go through the, the correct funnel, the correct system. And once you go there, then you can kind of be educated in what you need to know as far as getting your audience dialed in correctly, getting the results that you want. That way you, you can see some small results and then grow and then scale and then do more of this and finally put an end to the frustration of the paid ads or just trying to reach these new customers and, and wondering like, why is the business not going as fast as they want it to? Well, now you can actually have some deliberate, predictable actions and results with the help of Mr. Jim from RMG. I'm not even going to try to say the last name because it's, it's <laughs> difficult, but that's okay. You don't need to be able to say his last name. You just need to know to go to the website and talk to him and get his help. And as we're uh, people are going to rmg-usa.com slash marketer of the day here, Jim. I like to end these conversations with a, a bang instead of a whimper and try to stump my guests a little bit and ask them about a fun quote or lesson that has helped them throughout the years that they can pass on that can help us. So does anything come to mind as far as a, a fun, helpful quote or lesson from you? Well, there's an, a very old quote uh, from John Wanamaker. So it makes it about 93 years old, right? That I, I know that that 50% of my advertising is wasted. I just don't know which half it is. I, I think that that's been kind of a background driver for RMG. You know, the holy grail of advertising for years and years has been be able, being able to identify exactly who is the person that clicks on our advertising and why they buy. I'm not sure we're there yet, but I feel like we're a lot further down the road. And I feel like we've gone a long way to remove the question that John Wanamaker was kind of uh, posing back 93 years ago. That's very powerful. And I've heard that quote, and it, it tells me to, to not strive for 100% perfection, but still move towards perfection. And when we know that, well, half of my uh, my ads don't work, but the other half do, I'll just keep moving in that direction. And we don't have to go it alone. We can get the help of Response Marketing Group, RMG, by going to rmg-usa.com slash marketer of the day. And thanks so much, Jim, for showing up, giving us some reminders, some new lessons, some stories, et cetera. I really appreciate it and, and appreciate you as well. Thanks, Robert. I enjoyed it.